Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Open Science Conference 2023. I hope you all had a good break here in Germany and Kiel. We had a good lunch break and had a really interesting discussion with our team about our first two keynote speakers and are certainly looking forward to continue with our next two, two keynote speakers this afternoon. Yeah, without further ado, I'd like to continue our digital trip and see now if we have Mr. Leonard Volz with us today. Ah, Leonard, hello. Good afternoon, Leonard. Ooh, hi. Yeah. Can you hear and Excited see us? To be here. Nice to be here. Yeah, nice to have you. Since we have guests from around the world, I always want to check to make sure we pronounce the names correct. Is it Leonard Voltz? No, that's uh, close, close enough. It's close uh, enough. How would you pronounce it? I think the, the German would be Leonhard Voltz. Leonhard uh, Voltz, okay. Uh, we, we try our best. We try our best. But we can go Purdue with Leonard. And yes, we wanted to briefly introduce you before we heard your keynote speaker. Um, Leonard is at the University of Amsterdam, which I checked out has over 3,000 PhD researchers and an annual budget of $850 million, very impressive. And the University of Amsterdam is one of the largest broad-based research universities in Europe, and in my opinion, also one of the most beautiful cities in Europe, too, so that's a win-win. Yes, and Leonard is a research master student at the University of Amsterdam, majoring in psychological methods and computational statistics. Over the last years, he's been active in numerous national and international open science initiatives, always promoting a student perspective. Besides this, he has been teaching in various courses at the University of Amsterdam and the University of Vienna, building a passion of education and open science didactics. This experience uh, inspired him to talk today mainly from the engagement in the Student Initiative for Open Science, also known as the SOSIP in the Netherlands. The Open Science Working Group of the Psychology Science Conference, the SOSIP in Germany, and the Journal of European Psychology Students. Leonard is passionate for open and sound research methods in psychological science. And today, his talk will be Student Education in Open Science, Highlighting Academic Structures. Before I give you the stage, just a reminder, you have about 20 minutes. In case it goes a little bit longer, you might just hear my voice interrupting, saying, please wrap it up. And then we'll go to our questions from Slido from the audience. So it's my pleasure to give our digital stage over to Leonard Foltz. Leonard. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks very much uh, for the introduction. Um, and yeah, I'm going to dive right in. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit about my uh, experience and thoughts on um, the student perspective on open science and how that relates to uh, how we currently structure academia and changes I would like to uh, see at least personally. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, I was already mainly explained by, by David, but I think my um, to quickly sketch out who I am to get a slightly better or to give you a slightly better perspective of uh, why I'm here, what I want to talk about, where my experiences come from. Um, I did my bachelor in Vienna a couple of years ago. Um, mainly focusing on educational psychology and uh, for a while, a couple of years, quite involved in academic management, assisting uh, the dean of our faculty and being quite involved in uh, the student council uh, there as well um, on the side, then um, also studying statistics, tutoring in various uh, courses along the way. Um, and then moved to Amsterdam to go a bit deeper into the methods, uh, statistics, computational methods uh, um, direction. And here then increasingly also um, having a focus on uh, open science, especially in the direction of open source, op uh, open source statistical software, um, open data and uh, those sorts. And yeah, for I think five years, roughly, I'm also active in various student initiatives. I think I would uh, mention most of them. Um, I think the one that started the earliest was the Journal of European Psychology Students. I was also here at the Open Science Conference two years ago to talk a bit more about uh, publishing in a student context. And I think this is this talk here can be seen as a bit of a follow up um, uh, with a slightly broader perspective. Mm -hmm. But then also increasingly started to be active in the Open Science Working Group at the Office of Co. I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. Uh, the Student Initiative for Open Science. And I think so, like, what sort of makes my perspective unique in that sense, or at least uh, think a bit special, uh, is 
this fo focus there on or having been in multiple uh, aspects, multiple uh, fields of open science, so to say, uh, be it open source, but open access and publish uh, publishing. Um, then you go from the with the psychology perspective, looking into reproducible research and very much also open education from uh, in those initiatives, both the working group for open science, uh, SOSIP, and yeah, there with, and here in Amsterdam with the student initiative for open science, we've been pretty active uh, around science communication and uh, open science community building within the open science community uh, network here in the Netherlands. Um, so I think I've had my fair share of different perspectives in and around, in and around open science. Uh, there's a couple of other minor uh, things there as well, looking into team science with the psychological science accelerators. But yeah, as I said, very much also the uh, network of open science communities here in the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, to dive into the actual topic and talk a bit less, less about myself, um, I think what's uh, sort of unique about the student situation uh, in and why I think it's important to highlight that is that students are very much consumers of research primarily. They have a pretty passive role in uh, where within academia, within science. Um, and adding to that, uh, as a student, there is relatively little previous knowledge. So you're very much embedded in a uh, formation process of your place, how you uh, conceptualize research, conceptualize uh, doing science and uh, this is very much embedded in, in curricular education which is quite individualized and streamlined um so i think that contrasts to like uh, researchers uh, in later stages of the careers that are more active uh, doing dual course increasingly uh, build up knowledge and increasingly are not following any of the that paths um, in what they're doing. Um, and I think that's always interesting to think about and highlight, uh, which uh, to me then uh, leads to those three aspects that make this situation more, uh, or aspects that you need to consider when uh, thinking, talking of students. On the one hand is like, what is the motivation of students for open science, but also how do you build motivation for open science? How do students get exposed to open science? So how do we, how do you even learn about it? Um, and to some degree, also, what's the capacity of students to do open science, or in which capacity, how to think about um, embedding open science in the learning experience of students? Um, and I think along these lines, I'm trying to present my thoughts now um, in the next fifteen minutes. Um, and I wanted to start off to sort of give my short summary of why the, the, the students initiatives or how these students initiatives that I uh, am part of were formed and then um, so I've also developed along the years. Uh, first, I'm going to um, start with the working group for open science uh, of the UCFACO. Um, the UCFACO is a, uh, a German-wide conference of student councils in psychology. So. Um, a biannual gathering of uh, student councils all over Germany um, to discuss matters of psychology students all, all over uh, um, that are um, kind of common across the whole co uh, country. Um, and how the working group in open science started up is uh, 2018, there was a proposed position paper that uh, Ordered on the or uh, uh, revolves around the topics of the replication crisis and open science in psychology, um, and making some demands for uh, embedding that in in teaching more concretely. Um, the follow up though, like very quickly developed this idea. Okay, we have we see this, uh, issues. We see a lack of uh, these topics being discussed from personal experience. But let's assess how. Uh, Deep the problem actually goes, so to say, or state of the <laughs> affairs. Um, and then this working group was founded first with this idea of, okay, let's survey psychology students across uh, Germany and uh, just assess this. This uh, was published 
uh, eventually last year has been a bit of a process um, in the Psychologische Rundschau, which is the publication outward of the um, German Society for Psychology, DGPS. Um, and through the special issue that our, um, our survey that was published at, we increasingly got in contact with uh, different um, subgroups, working groups of the DGPS as well. Um, went to uh, several conferences uh, along the lines and uh, had thought exchange, talked to pe people, talked to researchers, um, doing open science within uh, in Germany or uh, within uh, German psychology, so to say. Um, and yeah, then uh, this developed uh, more and more uh, activity and also in collaboration with other in institutions. Um, but we, throughout the years, always were uh, very much active in organizing talks, organizing workshops, um, or discussions, panel discussions with uh, that try to uh, target students with different open science topics, um, and uh, kind of also specifically organize them in a way where, where students uh, benefit from it. Um, and I think one of the one we're sort of most proud of is an ongoing now and second round year long uh, workshop series with the Zepet, the Leibniz Center for Psychology. Um, and yeah, but so that's sort of the rundown here. The other one is the Student Initiative of Open Science here in Amsterdam that was also uh, founded in 2018 around the same time. Um, it firstly, embedded within a course, good research practices here at the um, here at our faculty, um, and it was a, a, a slightly different uh, idea at the start. I think the uh, sense of the founders back then was that uh, these topics are important, but not uh, well represented enough in uh, the education. So let's organize some extracurricular activities um, around uh, bringing open science to students. But then, but then also organizing workshops, talks, slightly more locally, of course, writing about open science, um, especially in the start, also in our uh, student newspaper here at the faculty. But this then also very quickly became a bit more of a larger thing, um, uh, going to open science conferences or, psych uh, or psychology conferences. Uh, mostly in the Netherlands, and then there were also some other chapters of SIAS established in Utrecht or Twente, so different cities, and um, and we sort of then uh, slowly also integrating into the open science community network, where now SI is part of um, an institution within the open science uh, OSC Amsterdam um, board. So next to the universities, we SI is also have a seat at the table, which is quite nice in this context. Um, but yeah, that's currently where we're at. We're trying to get size more structurally uh, embedded into the open science community here in the Netherlands. Um, but yeah. Um, and, uh, to sort of summarize this, this idea, what uh, or generalize it a bit, think what made the like what how these initiatives formed is very much a individual driven um a couple of individuals i would say me included uh were very passionate about open science found these topics important and had the drive to uh connect with our students and so if, um the open science topics more close to students in general um and to some degree, also just had a position in which we could do that, like, for example, being a research assistant, so having experience, but also having access to uh, resources. Um, and in that sense, also, there was an existing network so somewhere, and there is an existing society within the, like, with the Psifaco or uh, local support with uh, teachers of courses or so um, here in Amsterdam. And there was a relatively uh, good way to be integrated uh, with or into other open science interest groups to make our voice more heard, uh, better heard. Um, 
And yeah, lastly, I think it's also important that with this, it, uh, it probably wouldn't have uh, uh, gone this way or if we didn't have other experiences within the academic systems. And I think very much also within the Sifa core reflected in uh, individuals who were um, active in student representation, student councils in other capacities before already, and then being able to uh, facilitate the organization through personal contacts we had established already. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is I have a couple of thoughts about this uh, focus on organize, organizing extracurricular activities. Um, I think as to some degree, that's the only way to go as students. And you see that very much reflected in many open science um, initiatives uh, that it often is a an extra thing, it's something that's not necessarily normal. And that leads to very stark selection effects within who is targeted by uh, these activities. Uh, specifically, it includes people who are already very interested in, in the topics and to some degree have a certain privilege of being able to dedicate the time, dedicate the resources to these extracurricular activities. Um, and so there's a big question around what is the personal benefit, uh, motivation to do this, both for the uh, target audience, if in our case, students we want to reach, but also very much for ourselves. Like we often um, or almost exclusively do this on a volunteer basis. Um, which also makes it very important for us to have a personal benefit to get out of this. Um, but um, yeah, that's uh, something that's very much uh, interesting to tiptoe around because it, uh, how do you make this a worthwhile effort that, uh, um, and this very much gets at this rewards incentive system, I think that is probably known to all of you. And, uh, in the context of open science. The other hand is, uh, I think with both of these initiatives, it very quickly got into a, okay, how can we influence decision-making to get this more structurally embedded, connect with other interest groups? How do we as students all get a seat at the table? Um, how do we get some standing within decision-making processes to enable change? And how do we ourselves, but it, uh, more broadly, uh, get rewarded for effort, both in learning about open science, but also kind of doing the effort and trying to get open science more embedded. Um, and that brings me to this bigger part of sort of structural considerations that I want to uh, get at. Um, for me, students very much are, are a uh, microscope for uh, getting at some issues that plague uh, academia more generally, also for other groups. And uh, that relates to that students just are tomorrow as researchers, pr pr practitioners. So uh, teaching is important in the sense of you want to build a solid basis for uh, doing the people doing research very soon. And knowledge is also something that compounds. So the earlier you do learn about things, earlier establish a skill, a certain skill set, the easier it is to build on on that, learn more. Um, and, uh, I think also in general, like, uh, the earlier you establish a certain culture, the more it can flourish, can grow it, uh, to, into something bigger, um, and issues kind of then are, uh, related. And that's where the microscope comes from, where, where certain aspects that are always an issue within the open sciences course, dependence structures on supervisors. So what are the incentives around assignments um, or short timeframes that make certain things uh, to, uh, or make certain things a bit of an issue to include in the in your research process? Or how do I acquire sources? Like are things openly accessible? Are often even more strong, um, stronger within a student context where there is even less funding, you don't get paid for the work you do, you're completely dependent on your grading or so on. Um, but yeah, uh, and in this slide, a couple of things to go into a bit, uh, bit more detail is on the one hand, how is how do we structure teaching? 
think a big question mark is our student do student uh, how do we build self-efficacy uh, for students to be active and um how do they find motivation what motivates them to do uh things to learn um can we structure education to be more application transfer transfer focused um and how do we establish room for creativeness for students um how do we build a certain knowledge bases and i think a big question mark uh, or a question to get it is uh in the slide that uh, in teaching early teaching of students you probably build the uh basis or like get these aspects integrated the easiest you do you need to also be able to put in the effort as an educator as a teacher so how do we uh, make it possible that we can that uh, teachers can change assessment stru structures um, have the time or effort to uh, or can put an effort to uh, greatest assignments and a big question mark of just openness what is the access to uh, for students but also can we make uh, student work rewarding and making it public, making it accessible, making it a valid research uh, re research output in itself so, um, and get it making students be part of building an open uh, knowledge resource? Um, and in this topic, we, uh, we also, with uh, friends from both sides and SOSA on Thursday, have a workshop um where we want to dive a bit deeper into how to actually do this is there a way for everyone uh, to uh, introduce a student-focused open science perspective into their teaching so please do come if you registered uh, but yeah uh, we'll also make the uh things we talk about at the workshop accessible so please do check them out later as well uh, after thursday um but yeah to get to the second issue i think like the topic of incentives is very much often discussed you're all familiar with it but big thing is what are the opportunity costs um and it's especially relevant for students who oftentimes don't get much credit in doing open science implementing open science why would you learn about open science do open science if you have to learn study for courses or um why is this even important and something i noticed in my also very much in my own development is thinking about open science in a broader ter term and thinking about how can we include different aspects of open science in uh, teaching in different in everything we do is very much helpful um, also something within size we really just discovered while um students often have a hard time to get at okay why is open source relevant i think science communication for example is something that's very much close to uh, students experiences um and uh it, it always for me comes back to this how do we how do we establish a learning orientations within students like what do we as students study for as researchers uh work for um and always put open science as, into something it's just an uh, inherent goal of science and not something you sort of attach on top of what you already have um but i think that's probably to me always one of the hardest part to grasp or get across to other students like what is your personal benefit of doing this if you're not already interested like i am for some reason um, and I think the last thing is uh, for students um, is the issue of funding. Like if you if you do student research, it is oftentimes hard to get uh, resources for what you want to do. Um, do students even have access for open access funding uh, to open access funding at your university? Um, it's oftentimes very little ways to get uh, do things get funding without a an, an explicit often tenured supervisor I'm not entirely really sure why that needs to be the case um and that, so looking for what is student access for small groups scale grants I think that's like something we really struggle with right now there's even for us as I know like uh exists for multiple years existing initiative um it's sometimes very hard to just uh make things possible for ourselves like we do luckily have access to printing or uh, can book rooms at our university that's oftentimes just within the context of us working in other um, 
positions at the university. Um, and a big thing is, is there some way to get student to get funding for student positions? So there's you can establish a continuity and some expertise uh, as a student initiative because it's always it is extracurricular academic work, but for us it's often unpaid. Um, and yeah, there is issues around can students apply to project funding? Um, how it can money be handled in this context? As if a person like there's no way for students to access uh, money at the university, like because there you don't have a position that allows you to be in, in contact with finance departments or so. Um, and oftentimes, revenue time, uh, revenue time the plans just also don't work for a student reality. If it takes one and a half years for you to get a, a revenue and as the project begins, you're basically graduated by, with your master's already uh, after having started. Um, um, but yeah, so to uh, slowly get to the, or very as quickly as possible, we get this wrapped up. Uh, where does this for me lead to? Um, on a structural level, I think it's very important to integrate students into academic structures. Um, that's on one hand means establish, for example, establish positions for students, student assistance positions in multiple levels of the, the academic system. That is both on a like research assistant level, but also teaching level make it possible for students to experience academia. To some degree, also uh, struck a uh, structurally management positions like for me it was very beneficial to just look into processes by being an assistant in our faculty for for a while like directly as the star dean but also include the voice of students into decision makings do students have a seat at the, at the table do you think about the voice uh, or the perspective of stu students in the system because it will come around very quickly when these students three years later are then coming PhDs in your uh, in your institutions and might or might not be uh, qualified uh, as well as you would like to be to uh, be and uh, even broader probably make education a more central pillar in how we conceptualize academia. Um, you have this idea of you do get better qualified people in your own institutions because it's usually funneled from your own students. Um, and I think all, also education is something to that's central to uh, the mission of public education. Like students do. Um, I just asked to interrupt. Become, if, if you could please wrap it up, we're going over the time yeah, limit. No, I just, sorry. Um, you have a few more sentences. Yeah, that's uh, fine, please. Yeah. No, I think the uh, point I always like to, to make is uh, ma making education targeted to students always helps senior researchers as well. And for you personally, uh, personal takeaways, try to enable student engagement in everything you do yourself. Um, include students in your active research as collaborators and not as free laborers uh, or fr free laborers. Um, and try to always open up this hidden curriculum of, uh, of academia, uh, be transparent in how you do research also to students who might not know how processes work and uh, do pre present uh, career paths, diverse career paths to make students inspired to pursue uh, things. Also open science, uh, because it leads, it can lead to very interesting personal development. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, and here's a couple of links to contact us and me uh, personally as well. Thanks very much. So. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation, Leonard. Sorry we had to cut it a little bit short, but we wanted to make sure we have a little bit of time for some questions and answers from you. So uh, I think we already have one or two questions, um, and I see the first one coming up here. Let me read it to you. I'm an open science librarian and hope to create greater awareness of open science for postgraduate students. Do you have any suggestions? Um, my audio just cut out, uh, but I hope you can okay. still hear me. Can, can you hear um, me now? Can you hear me now? One, yeah. two, three. Yeah. No, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay, super. Perfect. Super. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. You should see it hopefully on your screen too. I'm an open science librarian and hope to create greater awareness of open science for postgraduate students. Do you have any suggestions? Um, I think that's a question we always struggle with as well. Um, 
talk to people, uh, talk to postgraduate students and uh, ask them what they need, what they could uh, get from you. I think a big thing that like always baffles me is why uh, for in with review work, with meta-analyses and so on, you, you don't automatically have support from the library. Um, but yeah, I think this, this orientation of what is the service you can offer um, for, and how do you connect to people because there's often very important resources. This, uh, yeah, it's important, but I think the first step is always talk to people and ask, uh, get experiences, what they need, and then in an iterative process, develop a pace uh, of uh, getting there. Mm. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question from our audience. If we can blend it in here. If you yourself represented the student community in a decision-making body, what would be your main demands regarding incentive assessment structures? Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, it's also something I'm very much thinking about uh, these days. Um, I think the biggest thing is try like make room uh, to have assessments not be um, uh, not be regurgitative in that sense. Uh, in that sense, it's not about like uh, it's it's not about memorizing, but it's about learning, and that often goes hand in hand with something you're interested in. So I think it's uh, making space for more diverse um, student work and rewarding creativity is, is important. Like I, I, I don't see why you have to write an essay in a course if you could uh, make uh, it available for students if they would like to write, if they would like to record a podcast, if they would like to make visual explainers or maybe build some small open source projects. Um, and probably get away from this idea of can we make this accessible, but rather can we make this interesting for students and mm. get some tangible uh, outcome out of it that you, uh, that you can also then have on your CV or something. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and then create positions for students so that they can actually do stuff and get paid for it. <laughs> yes, um, of course. And, and I think I, like nice, nice thing there is students are also often quite cheap. So I think getting three student assistants might be cheaper than like getting a <laughs> PhD position. Um, small, small hint. Yeah, very good. And, and on that note, um, again, thank you very much for your presentation, the excellent Q and A's from our audience. I think we can all agree that uh, getting young people interested and involved in open science is very crucial for the future. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us and enjoy the rest of the Open Science Conference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thanks very See much. You. Uh, same to you. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.